As I said, I only have 13 slides, so you're already down one, so we're, we're not off to a bad start. Um, I have three areas that I really want to cover. Um, I just want to give you a current situation. As I said, uh, as Duncan said, I cover, I look after energy efficiency, so the current grant schemes, uh, the National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, the negotiations for the new directive, that all falls into my area. And then for my additional sins, I'm also responsible for energy poverty. Um, and for those who might be interested in it, we published a strategy, the first strategy on energy poverty last year in November. Um, but anyway, I just want to set a little bit of context. I want to then look at the next 18 months, which is 2012, 2013, and then what I consider long term, which is 2014 and beyond, um, really getting us up to 2020 and beyond that. So they're the three areas that I want to cover. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I did some funny um, uh, transitions, um, which I've never done before. Um, okay, so state of the nation. Um, I just wanted to give a, a sense. People talk about a million euro, a million buildings is, was, was one of the targets that was set down under the pre, well, two governments ago, really. Um, we've done retrofits. I would consider most of them would be low, in, uh, not deep retrofits, shallow retrofits, in about 123,000. It's probably gone up to about 130,000 now. There is. Uh, 310,000 and it's separate energy efficiency measures, which is kind of substantive enough. If you take the occupied housing stock and, and estimates vary probably around 1.7 million. Um, and then if you take off the social housing and voluntary housing, you're talking about maybe about 1.6 million dwellings um, in the country. You see that we are making a bit of progress. Um, we spent 210 million already on domestic energy efficiency measures. Uh, we have plans to spend a lot more this year as well. Um, the one in five that a lot of people would have heard maybe in the previous session, yeah, that's about right. We think it's about one in four, one in five. Um, so the return is, is very substantive to the state. Um, we've already realized 850 gigawatt hours. It's kind of interesting actually where you spend your money from, from my perspective as a policymaker is when you're coming to divvy up the pool of money that has been allocated to you, and it is very much, it is allocated to us, um, no matter what kind of case we can make, um, you always sort of look at, well, where's the best bang for the book? And the best bang for the book is definitely not in the domestic sector, it's in the commercial sector, um, by a factor of about four or five to one. Um, so I know Adrian had said in the previous session that there was quite a, a substantive amount of energy efficiency potential already realized within the industrial sector. Well, our view is that there's still a considerable amount that's outstanding. And any of the grant programs that we've run or SEI have run on our behalf, they've been oversubscribed at least by four or five times. So that gives you the scale of the demand that's out there. So even if the demand on the domestic side may, may not be as strong as it was, the demand in other sectors um, is very much alive and kicking which is very positive, I should say. Um, I'll just maybe just mention uh, one of the things, the second last bullet points talks about there, the energy saving targets for energy suppliers. This is uh, year one, on, well, year two actually, of a three year cycle. Um, all our energy suppliers, both net bound, i.e. the electricity and gas suppliers, and the non-network connected energy suppliers, such as coal, solid fuels, and oil, all have signed up to voluntary agreements. I do say voluntary. There is a big legislative stick in the background if they choose not to sign a voluntary agreement um, to deliver energy savings um, over a three-year cycle. The idea being that that first three-year cycle will conclude at the end of 2013, um, which is very um, in harmony with lots of other things that are going on, the energy efficiency directive being one, and then also potentially a transition out of grants. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So. I just mentioned there non-domestic grants. I said, as I said, it, it's very, very positive. We have seven and a half million this year available for non-domestic, and um, that may actually increase depending on how things go. Uh, and again, judging by last year, we expect that to be very much oversubscribed again, um, and that forms the backbone of our energy saving uh, target, effectively. Right. So, where do we see? Where do I see things going um, over the next couple of years? or sorry, the next 18 months. The government, this government has said clearly that um, it's going to, and I don't speak for the government, but I speak for the civil servants that work for the government. Um, the government has said that grants will continue through the, the end of 2012 and through 2013, um, after which time they will cease, um, which sort of poses me with great difficulty because we have a considerable amount of economic activity in the construction sector around retrofit. And we definitely don't want to see all of that falling off the end of the edge of a cliff. 
um, ultimately if we're going to deliver our 2020 targets and if we're stepping up to 2030, 2050, we need a functioning uh, construction sector that's active in the retrofit area. So therefore we need to come up with new ideas, new thinking in both the domestic and non-domestic sectors. So we have a very clear deadline which is end of 2013 grants are supposed to stop. So that's, that's the thing that we're working to. So we have finally, um, and I say this with great delight, submitted a draft of the second NEEP to the Commission. It is only about nine months late. Um, our last one was about a year and a half late, so we are reducing that time down. Ideally, when we get to NEEP 3, we actually, might actually meet a Commission deadline. However, I would say probably that it's, I would say it's one of the better ones. Certainly the last NEEP was recognised by the Commission as one of the best if not the best NEEPs in terms of the number of actions and the specificity, I, I can never say the word, the, the level of detail that we provided to underpin those actions. This one takes it to the next stage. Again, we've actually increased the number of actions that we think we've gotten rid of an awful lot of ones that were maybe a little bit wishy-washy. The actions that we have now in our second NEEP will be very, very specific and uh, a lot more of them actually have energy saving potential associated with them. So that's very positive. Um, it does say, and maybe I'm letting the cat out of the bag a little bit, but it does say that we are going to meet our 20% target um, on the basis of some of the things that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Um, so key, up, key on that to meet our target is two things really. One of which is a, an ESCO framework, and maybe ESCO is not necessarily the right word, it's energy performance contracting that can take a number of different guises. We see that as very much uh, an important piece of the puzzle on the non-domestic, which will include the public sector. For those that know, we have a 33% energy reduction target in the public sector for 2020. That would realize annual energy savings of the order of about 150, 160 million a year. Um, I say in the order of, because we really don't know, and no European country does know how much to spend in the public sector on energy. So one of the big projects, and, and potentially a world leader, and, and I'm really, really positive about this project is, uh, to measure the energy consumption in every, by every public sector body, and again, it was, came up in the previous sec session by one of the contributions from the floor, is if we can meter and get all of the information from all the different meters from all the different public sector bodies and give them a mechanism to report all that information, suddenly we can start developing policies, interventions, actions and measures that can target energy consumption, because really we don't know. In every, in every country, the, the energy consumption figure for the public sector is usually a remainder from every other sector. Um, so that tells you how accurate it is. Um, so what we're trying to do is we have written out, we have identified all public sector bodies in the state, uh, including hospitals, schools, uh, public central government, uh, local authorities, bodies that um, may not have been considered public sector but are now considered public sector, such as maybe uh, the banks, um, because they're funded by the state, so they now come in <coughs> under our obligations as well, and they have responsibility, so sorry about that, Paul. Um, but effectively what that will do is require all these organizations to report on an annual basis um, uh, their energy consumption. Now, we're going to make that a lot easier because what we've said is we were working with the network companies to say, right, here is a list of the MPRNs and GPRNs, i.e. the meter point numbers on electricity and gas, um, for all of those bodies. So what we've done is we've segmented all the 4,500 organizations or the 10,000 buildings that we've got into high energy consuming and medium energy consuming and low energy consuming and said, right, well, we've got limited capacity, so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the first 100, the, the major 100 consuming organizations. So what we're going to do is we're going to give a big data dump down to the network companies and they're going to come back with us and say, right, here is the energy consumption over the past 12 months for all of those MPRNs and GPRNs. So that's the first stage. The second stage is to capture all the non-metered energy consumption data. And we have a lot of ideas around that, but really we need that first stage information. Ideally what I would say in joining with what the Minister said about public procurement is one of the things that I would like to see is at some stage in the future, if you are tendering for the supply of energy in a non-metered sector, that you are re required to provide additional information through an online database in terms of the, the amount that you supply to a particular organization. So the idea being we make it as easy as possible for public sector organizations to capture that information. Ideally, it should just be a way of doing business. So we make the tools as easy as possible for people and that that information comes back in and then we design policies and measures around that. So that's one thing. I've sort of gone off a little bit on track, but that is a really exciting project and if people are interested, the, the whole NEEP, there's a very specific um, focus on public sector in this second NEEP and there's a lot on that piece. But it is very, very interesting because we, we uh, hired a consultant to go off and look around the world 
the closest thing we could find is in the States. Uh, even they didn't go as far as what we're proposing to do. Nobody else in Europe is doing it. It is a subject of great interest at a European level and something that we've presented a number of times at concerted action meetings uh, in Europe. So the second piece is development pays. Uh, and I should stress, and I, I do want to stress this, is that this is not approved. This is today's session. What I'm going to talk about is very much about giving people an opportunity to comment. However, government has not signed off on this. Government has it in a program for government, and I'll get into that in a little bit of a sec. It, but that's all it is at this point in time, so it is a concept, and I do want to stress that. I know it's in the brochures, maybe Ireland's Green New Deal, but uh, maybe that's a little bit of a step too far at this point in time. So 2014, as it's talked about, transition away from grants. On the domestic retrofit side, ideally pays is the thing. On the non-domestic, uh, which is public sector and commercial, it's energy performance contracting. Um, so they're the big things. And then underpinning all of that is the energy saving targets for energy suppliers. So that's the big framework that I see from 2014 and beyond. All of this will be in NEEP in probably a lot more detail, so I'm giving you this very, very succinct version today. Um, I should say that the energy saving targets is probably the biggest thing that we have done in terms of uh, new policy initiatives going forward. I think the grants are all very well but ultimately we're transitioning away from grants and we need to put something on a more sustainable footing. The energy suppliers probably don't think it's a sustainable footing because they're challenged by this. But I think um, given what we've heard from Adrian today about the directive, um, there is a target, that the Commission proposed a 1.5% energy saving target on an annual basis that would be delivered by the energy suppliers. So we do think that this is something that needs to be in place. We've looked very closely at where it's in place already. We've gone to the next level by including the oil companies and the solid fuel suppliers as well, which no other country has done. France is doing the oil companies, but they're not doing the solid fuel suppliers. So again, it's very, very ambitious. I am pleased to say that we have all of the major energy suppliers, certainly the net bound energy suppliers, already signed up to voluntary agreements. And we have our oil companies who are effectively signed up. They've appointed a managing agent. Um, all the details have now been worked out, and they're now aboard. And we also have the major uh, solid fuel suppliers on board. There are a few laggards, um, undoubtedly, which we will be pursuing through legal means, um, because we have to make it a fair uh, basis on which everybody can compete on the market. So if we are imposing a cost burden through this, which ultimately we are, um, everybody be, needs to be able to compete on an equal basis. So I'm probably already way over my time, but way, why pays? Pays, as I said at the outset there, it's a program for government commitment, um, and we need, to, we need to get away from grants. Grants, Irish people do like grants, I have to say. Um, it is a cultural, uh, I don't know, it's, it's something in our culture that we, we really do like grants. So we can motivate action like no other country through the use of grants. Um, in Germany, as, as again Adrian threw up in the other session, KFW in the States, they have various other mechanisms. Tax rebates seem to be a lot stronger in other jurisdictions than they are here. Um, but grants aren't very sustainable. And also, there's a high level of dead weight attached to that as well. So it's an area that I'm particularly not comfortable. I think you can prime the market using grants, but ultimately, you need to move away into something a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more uh, interesting. And that's where we're going for. So, uh, as I said, we need a sustainable long-term retrofit, and that's the 2020 target there. We need something in place that, that isn't going to pose a burden on the exchequer in 2020 and beyond, but that effectively allows the market to flourish and people to make capital investment decisions on the basis that they do see a future in this sector. So, what is PAYS? Um, PAYS has three fundamental concepts, and this is an American concept. Um, it is not ours. The Green Deal is, is, is built on this as well, for those that know in the UK. Um, it is three fundamental concepts. It's, it's probably, in fact, I know that it's, it's, uh, there is some, uh, uh, what's the word, I'm, uh, forget, um, the, the, um, the name is trademarked, sorry, that's what I was looking for. Um, so it's three fundamental concepts. There's a charge assigned to the meter location, not to the individual customer. So effectively what pays is, it means you pay for capital measures um, over the lifetime of, of um, the building. Um, but you don't pay anything up front, so you pay it back through your energy savings. Billing and payment are on the utility bill with disconnection for non-payment. That is a big issue, um, as most people can imagine. Sorry, I should say the first one is a big enough issue because it's a loan, but it doesn't go to the individual. It goes to the property, um, and that's a big issue, um, and certainly a challenge for the way in which lending has traditionally been done. 
Uh, disconnection for non-payment, well, when I raised that with our Commission for Energy Regulation, you can imagine the response I got there. Um, An independent certification that products are appropriate and savings exceed estimates. Again, that's actually that's okay. You know, there's no problems associated with that. So why is it a challenging concept? Um, it's really, really complex because at one level it's really, really easy. It's simply saying, well, if you're spending 100 euros uh, a month, we'll do all this retrofit work. We'll reduce that, your repayments, your energy bill to 50 euros, and we might take up to 50, the other 50 that you would have been spending anyway to repay the loan. Sounds very simple. But to put all of that piece together, as the UK have found, uh, is really, really complex. Because I think if it's to work, it has to work on the basis that all elements are joined up. So from suppliers, from government, from finance, from training providers, from certification, all of that has to be linked very, very, ta very, very strongly um, in order for it to work. But consumers don't want to know any about that. They just want to be able to get the loan. Well, we don't even call it a loan. They want to get the finance. They want to get a contractor. They want the work to them. And then they want the repayment to be as easy as possible. But joining all those systems, joining the billing systems, et cetera, huge amount of work, a lot of cost, et cetera, et cetera. Why is it challenging number two? Well, the availability of financing, as, as Paula so eloquently said, that is a, a big piece. Where do you get the financing? I think Paul has some really, really good ideas about where you can raise it. Um, interest rate. Well, uh, I think the, I heard a number from the UK that said for every 1% increase in the interest rate, uh, the return back on, on the funds that are, are given for the works to be done, uh, you need an additional 7% in energy <coughs> savings. So you can imagine. Once it reaches a certain point, it becomes very untenable and untenable, un well, doable. Um, I'd, I'd also say that you know, if you have, like, let's say, car loans are about 10 or 12 percent, that won't work. It definitely will not work at that level. You need to have an interest rate, in my view, way less than that. Half that, even half that, it's, it's a challenge. So how do you get those funds at that rate? And then, lastly, the, the issue that I think is the most difficult. Um, I think all of the above are solvable, but the one that's the, the real challenge is the consumer proposition. And I'll put in there in brackets um, and protection, because I think that that often gets missed. And I think one of the things is if you start a program out with a bad reputation, or if it gets a bad reputation early, forget about it. You're better off stopping and starting again. Um, and that is a really key issue. The UK are, are very good and very strong on the consumer protection provisions that they've put in their legislation. Um, so we might talk about that um, at the next stage. So what do we have? We have, uh, I, I robbed this unashamedly from, uh, I'm over already? Over at the moment. I, but, um, <laughs> I haven't even got to the interactive feed. <laughs> Joe, this is your fault. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll skim very through. As I said, these slides are available for people anyway, so, and I'm more than happy to talk through at a later point with people if they have individual questions. It's just really, really interesting because, you know, there, there is that S curve and, and, and people talk about, you know, early adopters, the laggards, the majority, et cetera, et cetera. There are tools and there are ideas around at each of the different stages how you incentivize action. And incentivizing action is key because don't forget that. Um, I think I heard somebody in the other room say people have to be made participate. Now, yes, on one level, but on another level, that's you're straying into dangerous territory. So, however, why it could work, and I do think there are a couple of really positive things. Um, shop electric. Um, everybody of an older generation, and, and I include myself because I'm still around for shop electric, at least the tail end of the years, before the, the, the Commission for Energy Regulation um, told them to stop shop electric, um, they had the lowest uh, default rate on loans than any bank. Um, they provided credit to what were, were considered the riskiest consumers, but yet they had the lowest discount rate. Why? Because the repayments were classically on the bill. So Irish people remember Shop Electric. They remember that they could use the utility bill to repay. The interest rates were still high, but people liked it. So they didn't really complain about the interest rate. They had a low level of default because it was the only way that they would get access to credit for washing machines, dishwashers, et cetera. So that's very interesting. The other one is, is the, uh, there is no Green Deal logo, which is, again, one of the failings of what I would consider the UK should have had from the start. They have a name, which is the Green Deal, but they have no logo. So when I was robbing logos, um, I had to rob DEX logo. But if Green Deal takes off, you know, it'll filter across the water. 
um, and that is a big if because they're supposed to be rolling out the first green deals by the end of this year, autumn this year. So there is both sides. And then the other things I would say is you can put in supply side mechanisms and demand side mechanisms, both of which sort of try to push and converge the market to, to adopting pays in whatever form it takes. Um, I always hesitate throwing up this slide um, because this is a very, very, very simple version of how I've tried to explain it internally as to how it could work. My view on pays is very different to how the proposal in the UK, there's a lot of good things in there, but my view is very strongly given the size and the culture of Ireland, it needs to be joined up and it needs to be run through a centralised body that has, let's say, oversight over all the different aspects and can censure all the different aspects as appropriate. I think the way in which the Green Deal, and I can understand why they've gone after the way they are, because they're a lot more, it's a lot bigger, it's a lot more difficult, you need a lot more resources. Ireland is a lot more focused, a lot smaller, and I think we have the mechanisms already in place to be able to pull something like this together. I don't propose to go through it, just to say that I have the four main actors. You can add in or take out actors, depending upon your view. It is only one view. It is an unofficial view. It is my view. And I have a number of these, all with different versions of this. But this is, I thought, you know, it's easy enough to understand. So if people want to have a look at that, they can come back to me. So where have we been? Um, we formed a project group, an informal project group, last year, which effectively finished its deliberations before the end of 2011. Uh, we had extensive engagement with the financial community, um, Paul, Bank of Ireland, AIB, other banks, New Era, NTMA, um, everybody, energy suppliers and a number of different organisations that maybe would have an interest and made themselves known to, our, to ourselves at the time. We completed 10 research papers across the spectrum of areas that we think uh, need to be addressed, including legislation, consumer demand, energy system, um, to name a few. Um, they all were brought in to myself um, and then we put a position paper up to the Minister. So effectively where we are is we are at the stage where we have a memorandum to government sort of prepared. It has to be brought forward by our Minister to government but we're doing the very difficult negotiations at the moment that always go on behind the scenes. Um, I would say it is extremely complex, it is extremely challenging. Um, the piece that I think we can build a system without any difficulty. The question is, do you bother building a system if you know it's not going to work? So there's key things in there that I'm looking to get government to say, yes, actually, you know what, we agree with that, and therefore we're willing to make really big changes in order to get in behind this. Um, and make no bones about it, there are really, really big things that need to change if this is to work, um, to get that in the demand there. So that was actually my last slide. So the piece that I was going to get to, um, I can't get to. But maybe if Joe does his presentation, and if there's still time, I can well, do the interactive ahead. piece. Go on, if you can. Uh, um, go ahead with it. If people are okay, yeah, yeah. if there's some. Yeah. Yep. That's very, very Okay. Just so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to reference Joe's presentation because he kindly forwarded it on to me yesterday. So um, Joe talks about the number and scale of opportunity, um, which is an important piece. So what I did at a previous conference um, was I threw this up as giving people an opportunity to comment. So when I talked about the 10 research papers that have been prepared, uh, they're, not for publicly, they're not publicly available. I won't make them publicly available. They're very much written um, on the basis of to inform policy decisions. They're very much informal. They're proposing stuff which is not controversial but could be sensitive enough. Um, that's the way policy needs to be done um, on the basis that you'll get uh, views and input that you wouldn't otherwise get if everybody has to be always politically correct. Um, so ultimately what we have, what I decided we'd throw up was eight of the different areas that I think are really, really interesting. Um, now what I had done in the last session was I threw it out to the floor and asked people to come back. So for example, um, if you have a pay system, what are the measures? And I, uh, I asked this question because in the UK they're very much focused on carbon. Um, in Ireland we don't necessarily have the same joined up. I come from the Department of Energy, I'm focused on energy efficiency, I have an energy efficiency target. So my primary goal is to deliver efficiency savings. 
Now that's logical because ultimately efficiency pays the bills. Carbon doesn't actually pay the bills for consumers. So if you're talking about pays and if you're talking about implementing a measure that gives you a carbon saving but no energy saving, there's no financial payback to the consumer unless you have other sticks in place and they would have to be sticks so that people see a financial penalty or incentive for action. So at the moment in time, you can just say, well, it, 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 the measures are really around energy efficiency. Structure, well, what does it look like? I mentioned that I think it needs to be a very much joined up process. Everybody needs to understand that it's part of one system so that they know there's a means of redress. Um, primarily, and they shouldn't, if consumers have a problem, and I, I think maybe, you know, if I say hand and heart, um, maybe on Chatham House rules here, but maybe that's an issue that we have under the current grant scheme, is for various different reasons, and they are all very, very good and sound legally, that consumers, when they have a problem with the contractor, they have a problem with the contractor. Um, and one of the things, if pays to work, I think you almost have to have more of a, a, an active role in that. Non-domestic, well, how does it work on the non-domestic side? That's very, very important. Um, what's the consumer proposition, and how do you get consumers to, to buy into this? It's all very well and um, saying, okay, well, we need to renovate you know, X number of buildings and stuff like that, and we need to get consumers to spend seven grand, 10 grand on their homes, but, well, would you at the moment? Probably not. Um, and I think we have, to, we have to put in place carts and sticks on that side if it's gonna work, and that's probably a big challenge. Uh, nobody likes sticks. Technical design, um, how do you put the standards in place? Well, I think we have a bit of experience on that, and the, uh, one of the projects that I think the Minister made reference to is the Code of Practice, which we, we were very at the forefront in, in pushing um, for, and that's going to be adopted and replace all the technical standards that SEI currently operate, which will be great. It's ex extremely positive. I think it'll be world leading. Stakeholders, well, if you're building page, you're going to have to have a hell of a lot of stakeholders, and you cannot forget consumers on that. It cannot just be an industry-led initiative. Um, it has to be very much led by consumers, in far, as far as I'm concerned. Financing piece, well, we had really, really good engagement from the banks, I have to say. We had really good engagement, generally, from the financial community. Um, they're up for this. They're up for thinking differently, I have to say. Um, we have to make all of the rest of the pieces fit together in order for them to, to find a way of financing it. But I think we will find a way of financing it. And I think people like Paul are at the forefront of coming up with innovative thinking and models on that regard, because I do think it will require an, an, an innovative model. Um, and lastly, the sheer weight of legislative change that's required um, is kind of scary as, as a policymaker because that takes forever. Um, so I think maybe I'll, I'll leave it there. If we have some time after Joe's presentation and if people aren't too hungry, what we might do is we might revisit this and then we might have a bit of back and forth if that's okay. I just don't want to cut Joe off. Yeah. That's okay. Thanks,